Hey, it's me. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to a musical legend of the Caribbean. Barefoot Man is joining us. He's a singer, guitarist, recording artist, a songwriter of the approximately 2,000 songs he's written. He's recorded about 500. He's also a writer and photographer. Barefoot Man makes his home in the Cayman Islands. Born Horse George Nowak. It's a great pleasure to have him here. Barefoot Man, how are you, sir? I am 100%. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me on your show. It's a pleasure. So, what's a typical day like for Barefoot Man? What do you do each morning? Uh, okay. Well, I tell you what, I'm a, I'm a, I don't sleep, well, I, you know, I, I, I'm an early riser, put it that way. I, I get up usually around five in the morning and uh, I work here in my, I have a little office here in my home and there's always something going on between my, I do, I write for the uh, sort of freelance, okay, freelance writing for the local newspaper plus uh, magazines you know, around the Caribbean. I also do some cartoon work for the newspaper, uh, editorial cartoons, and then I have my projects, you know, which can be anything from, you know, booking dates to uh, working on some song ideas. Uh, I, I I write commercials for some of the radio stations here and TV stations. So about once, but once about ten o'clock hits. That's it. I cut everything off, and there's I enjoy our you know Caribbean weather out there. I do something. I'm either in the boat fishing, or I, I oh I don't know. I might clean the pool, or light up a cigar, maybe drive down the road to a couple of the local bars and visit some of my friends. I mean, I'm, I basically have the days to myself. Uh, you know, in in my job, I work in the evenings as a musician i do two or three regular jobs during the week um at some of the resorts performing and uh, the rest is just off and on you know whenever the the mood strikes me and so uh so between all that uh you know just uh hiding out here in, in my little home along the shore i i there's always something to do you know i, I certainly don't get bored i'll put it that way do you think that people maybe have uh, a couple of misconceptions about you? I don't know what you mean by that. I mean, I know what the word means, but I don't know what <laughs> what 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 you what you're referring to or what you're getting at. A lot of people might not see that. Yes, uh, you know, there's pleasure in music. There's pleasure in performing music, but there's. There, you know, the first thing you mentioned was pretty much you get up in the morning and you've got work to do. Oh, yeah. Okay, I see what you said. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, the nice thing about my my work, Paul, is I don't really have to do it. You know, it's something, like I said, the majority, my, the, the writing and the things like that uh, that I do, uh, it, it's freelancing. So I can, when when the mood strikes me, okay? And then so uh, I will send it to the publications here or some other publications in the islands. And they may accept it, they may not. If they don't, they don't. You know, I mean, I, I don't count on, it's not a, a part of my, uh, what I count on is to buy my bread and butter. Um, it's just, uh, I, I enjoy writing. I enjoy, uh, you know, a bit of photography. But if I had to, you know, put it in a nutshell, I spend maybe a quarter of my, free time doing that. The rest, I, I, I work very hard. I work very hard at not working, uh, just <laughs> enjoying, enjoying, <laughs> enjoying the tropics and the sunshine and the, and the fishing and that kind of stuff. And it, I mean, that's what I've always dreamed of, and that's what I'm still doing. So where did it all begin? Where are you from originally? Well, I'm originally from Germany. My, I was born in Germany. My parents are both German. I was, when I was about eight years old, my mother remarried uh, to a guy in the United States Air Force who was stationed in Germany. And through that, I ended up in the, in the U.S. 
And uh, so I was sort of brought up along the shores of North Carolina, uh, Wrightsville Beach uh, area, Wilmington, that area. And, of course, that's uh, I think that's where a lot of the, the, the sand between my toes uh, took effect. And so after I finished school, uh, I... I uh, headed over to Nashville, a uh, very, you know, young, naive songwriter with a plan to, you know, have a couple of hits, make a lot of money, and then go buy my own island somewhere in the South Pacific and live happily forever after. <laughs> and, if, and, it, and you know, in a way, it sort of turned out like that, but not quite like that. You, in other words, those were, those were teenagers' dreams, if you know what I mean. And uh, but I am living the islands. I'm living along the shore, and I'm enjoying life very much. Okay, and you know, and and uh, I've sort of had my little hits, but in my in my area, if you know what I mean, uh, it, it's the uh, how would I say it? The big fish in the small pond uh, effect, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's that 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 it's that kind of a thing. I I have a running joke all the time on my performance. And it's and it's a joke, but it's also trying to make a point. Um, I will say, I will talk to the audience. I say a lot of you folks don't know that I've done 22 albums, and every one of my albums have been certified gold. And of course, I get a big sigh from the audience and wow or applause. And then I clarify: on Cayman Islands, uh, we have to sell 32 copies to get a gold record. <laughs> so. <laughs> And again, you know, and, and if you start start to do, do the uh, the math, if you know what I mean, it would equal out about the same as what it would sell, what you have to sell in the United States with, you know, 600 million people or 60 million or whatever you have over there. So that, that's, and again, it's a joke. It, it, it's obviously a joke, but also it's a point, you know, I'm trying to make that, that uh, you know, to be... To be on the top ten on an island like this is, is you know, it, it's a, appreciative, but you, you, you got to realize that you're nothing, you know, but a dot somewhere on the globe. And if, once 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 you get that concept, you know, don't let it go through your head. Uh, it work. Life works out much better down here. So you think humility is important? Oh, oh absolutely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I. Uh, I I make fun of myself en- endlessly. I mean, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I do a bit of writing. I've done a few books, and I do ri- regular writing for magazines and paper here. And uh, they pay me for it, okay? I can make money. Yet, however, in school, I failed English. You know, I, when I landed in America at eight years old, I couldn't speak a word of English. Uh, so... My English was always bad. My grammar, my punctuation, that kind of a thing. I've never taken a, you know, I've never, I don't know what an F stop is or a light meter, but I I do a lot of photography. My my images are actually hanging in the, the museum here in the Cayman Islands. Um, I know three or four chords on the guitar, and I've learned to use them to write songs. So, I, you know, I've, I've never really... I'm a simple man, you know, been, however, been fortunate enough to make that simplicity work for me. So what was it about the Cayman Islands in particular, among the islands that are in the Caribbean, that you found most suited to you? Why do you live in the Cayman? Well, that, that's a great question and, and, a, and, a, and a story I've responded to many times. I lived in the before I lived in Cayman. I had gone to worked for a bit in the Virgin Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands. I had I was in the Bahamas a bit, just sort of you know best way to explain it, just sort of beach bumming around, and you know getting fed and getting a room to stay and free beer, in in return of you know performing in bars and lounges, and that guy. And then you know, or I would take people out diving or snorkeling. And, you know, I made a few dollars on the side with that. But Cayman came to be, I've always been very interested in geography and maps of islands. I've always, I've always been an island dreamer, and, and I would study maps, 
you know, not, not just at the, the dot, I would like to try to get atlases and really study the islands. And so if you, if you look at geographically, if you look at the Caribbean, you know, right from around uh, the Puerto Rico area, there's sort of a, a, a half circle that goes all the way down to Trinidad, which is the string of Caribbean islands. But then look at where Cayman is. It's out in the middle of nowhere compared to the other islands. It's, so I found that intriguing when I first saw it on the map. And I went to, and I'll never forget, now I'm going back to the to the early 70s. I went to the library in Miami, and I went to look up the Cayman Islands. And you know, this was back in the days before computer. You know, they had the real little Rolodex things, if you recall. Yeah. And you would... Yeah, you pull out a roll of decks and try to look something up there, and then they would tell you what section of the library was at. Anyway, the bottom line is I couldn't find nothing at all on the Cayman Islands. Nothing. Zero. And that was the first thing that intrigued me. I said, well, this place has to be neat if there's nothing in the library here. And I just started asking questions, and somebody had mentioned that that one LAXA, which is the airline that goes to, it's a Costa Rican national airline, they said that Laxa actually stops and came in about once or twice a week on its way to Costa Rica on their daily flights. But it only, even though they go daily a couple of times from Miami to Costa Rica, but once or twice a week they'll stop and came in. So I went and checked it out, and sure enough, they they did have a flight down. And I wrote a couple of the hotels here and back again before computer and email. So by the time I sent a letter from the Bahamas and and I got a letter back from Cayman, usually a month or six weeks waiting. And there were only about three hotels here at the time. And just one of the people who responded says, well, we can't afford an entertainer, but if you want to come down here and take people out fishing during the day, and if you want to uh, rake the beach, and, and, if you, and if you sing at night, we'll give you a place to live and, you know, and free beer, and, well, I mean, what more could I ask for? You know, I'm a 19-year-old kid. (laughs) It was heaven. (laughs) So anyway, that's why I picked Cayman, because it was, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, the Bahamas at the time already had casinos, okay? And, and all through the other, uh, the, 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 had golf courses in the Virgin Islands, but Cayman was really the end of the world. It was actually known then, the islands that time forgot. That's how they, some of the first tourism promotions, when the promoter came in, they say they were the islands time forgot, but, and there was, and when I landed here, there was nothing. You know, maybe three cab drivers. I think we have about 150 now. Wow. We had about three hotels, and if you add, added up all the rooms with the hotels on the entire island of Grand Cayman, between the three three hotels, I would say maybe there's 75 rooms, you know, and now we have, you know, a Ritz hotel that has that many rooms on one floor. Yeah. So, so, so it, the island has boomed. Uh, I don't particularly like the progress, but I'm progressing with the progress, if you, if you know what I'm trying to say. But And you can't really stop progress, so you just live with it. But, but it was nothing, it was nothing when I came here, and that's what, 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 I traveled around to a lot of islands, and even after I found Cayman, I traveled more, I, even to the Pacific in that area. But nothing was like Cayman because it was just still so remote and quiet, and nobody, you know, no rules. It was just, it was a little, it was a little paradise. I mean, it's still a little paradise, but but you know, unfortunately, uh, there's development, but and we can't stop that, you know. But it's nice development. It's for, Pretty classy development, if you were not true. Hmm. Now, you just said a moment ago that you you traveled around to some of the other islands. So, in yeah. the course of your exploring, uh, you've made your home in the Cayman Islands. But where, who, who would you have to give the honorable mention to? You mean of the islands? Yeah, a great island, like your second favorite place. Uh, my second favorite place is what I call my second home, which is the out islands of the Bahamas. 
preferably the Abacos. The Bahamas are gorgeous. You know, there, there's hundreds of islands over there. I don't much care for the main islands like Freeport and Nassau. They're not up to my <laughs> my enjoyment. You know, they're a little busy, too much going on there. But I recommend the out islands of the Bahamas to to anyone. But stay away from Nassau and Freeport, that's what I say. The uh, Grand Cayman, you know, we, we only have uh, four islands here. and uh, But you can still, you can do everything from staying on the Seven Mile Beach where we have hundreds of restaurants and gift shops and entertainment, etc. Or you can, like I was just last weekend, I was over in Little Cayman. And Little Cayman is about 70 miles from here with a population of maybe 200 people. And Little Cayman is, is a, 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 the jewel of, of, of this group of islands here. It's a beautiful place. We're joined by a Barefoot Man. For someone who has not heard your music, how would you describe your music? <laughs> That's another question I've often been asked. Well, you know what? Let's say, let's, let's take a blender, okay? And then let's put in a shot of country. Actually, maybe two shots of country. Uh, a shot of calypso, a shot of reggae, and about three shots of humor. And you blend it all up, and that's sort of what you have. I've always admired, you know, some of the Calypsonians from the Caribbean. And the the real, true Calypsonians, they would sing song, political political satire songs, you know, picking on politicians, or, or even a lot of risque stuff. But the secret with their... Music was, you know, try to make it as, as risque as possible, but don't say anything dirty. You know, leave it, leave it, leave it to the imagination. You know, of, of the of the person listening, what you're saying, and so use, using you know clever back and forth words. Uh, what, what do they call it? A double. Uh, I keep double that. entendre. That's the word I'm looking for. Yes, exactly. Um, and so that that's that's a lot of my songs are like that, you know. And uh, being brought up in North Carolina, of course, I've got a lot of country in me. And I don't much care for modern country. <laughs> uh, modern country doesn't do much for me, you know. To me, to me, country music is, you know, Johnny Cash and Merle Haggard and Willie Nelson. That's country music in my book. Yeah. Well, you just named a few artists, but who would you say have been the biggest influences on your style? Um, I would say maybe Johnny Cash and John Prine. I'm a big fan of John Prine. He is a because he because I enjoy writing. Uh, I really enjoy writing music and, and you know trying to create fresh ideas in a song. And John Prine is just a master, you know, at that. So I would, at, but, uh, but you know Johnny Cash, of course, uh, has always been I've been a big fan of his. So. Between those two, I think that's that would be a fair answer. No, you were just mentioning the double entendre, and so many of your songs, you're exactly right. You never actually say anything explicit, but it's just... No, no. Yeah. Do you ever have people who do get offended? Oh, of course. You know, the world the world is full of them. You know, I, I, I have to deal with that. And, you know, some... And you know, and and actually, there, most of those people who get offended in my book, they're just not too smart. Like uh, I've got a song called "Jeff the Muff Diver." Okay, now, oh, yeah. so uh, and and it's a, it, again, it doesn't say anything dirty. Okay, but I've had you know a parent come up to me and say, "Oh, how could you sing that song? I have my little boy here, and he's only five years old." So my immediate reaction is, well, miss, you don't have to tell your little boy what a muff diver is. You know, if you want to sit there and explain it to him, then you can't blame me for that. That's your problem. <laughs> and it, it's usually it's usually real silly, just really, just people who want to complain. You know, just people who are not happy unless they complain. But the majority of the people that I can, uh, performing so long I've, over all these years, I've learned to read the audience I think I've I think I've learned to read the pretty well. You know, I uh, 
I can sort of look at the expressions and then I, I, I can have a general idea where I can go from there. But, you know, you can't, it's impossible, it's impossible to keep them all happy. That can't be done. So you just do the best you can with it and what the heck, you know? Yeah. Well, what about your colleagues? Who who out there of your peers do you have the most respect for? Uh, you mean you mean like on the island, or or what do you mean on in the international scene? What are you saying? Uh, just like, just people who do music somewhat similar to you. Uh, they could be on the island. Yeah, well, you know, uh, we've got we've got some good entertainers and musicians here. Nobody quite does what I do because you know, the majority are you know they do cover songs. You know, they're tropical cover songs and very good. They're very good at it, and they do some writing. But if you hear me perform, usually, unless it's a, a wedding or something like that, and somebody wants something different, and usually eighty percent of my Evening is my own songs, you know, the songs that I've composed, and I tell the stories about the songs. Now, I, I don't say any of that to degrade the other local musicians here, because there are some very good musicians here, but they do their own thing. They have their own style. They, they have their own music that they like, you know, be, be it the real hardcore reggae or the maybe a little hip hop y thing. And uh, the, one of the guys who plays in my band, he also, on the side, he has a sort of a jazz sounding band he's a he's a very accomplished musician so they're all a little different and they all write a few little songs but not really in other words i write songs i make a living out of writing songs you know and a lot of uh, other musicians for example here really aren't that far far into the the songwriting bit but but i mean out there out there in the world there there's a guy called Rodney Carrington. I don't know if you ever heard of him. Yeah, I have. Um, uh, oh, I love Rodney Carrington stuff because again, he's just got a a great you know great sense of humor and 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 he and he always throws the audience for a loop with his hooks. And as I mentioned, John Prine too. Yeah, I just admire John Prine because he's just a great, just a superb songwriter. And again, you know, about anything you buy from John Prine, I've got almost all his albums. It's all his material, you know. He he he's wrote about every single song on it. I like good I like good writing. There's a group now that I'm sort of really starting to enjoy a lot. They're called Midland. They've sort of put a little true country sound back into country music. You know, instead of a I've got a I've got I did a making fun of modern country, I did a song called uh, Hip Hop with a Fiddle. And I'm just making fun of the modern country, which, you know, to, in my opinion, is not country, a lot of the modern country. But this band, Midland, they actually, they've had a couple of hits, and it's sort of coming back. They got, you know, the fiddle and the steel guitar and that kind of a thing. So, But writing, I, I, the bottom line is, 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 you know, anybody who's a good writer, I like. I've just always enjoyed writing. It's always been a favorite thing of mine. We're joined by Barefoot Man, Tell us the story about how your music found its way in the film, The Firm. Um, what happened is when Grisham, what's his name, John Grisham, right? Is that his first name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Grisham. When he wrote the book, he had mentioned in the book uh, a scene, a, a, a situation where uh, they were the 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 characters in the book were dancing to the Barefoot Boys in the Cayman Islands. Now, I think uh, he said Barefoot Boys uh, just to be, you know, legal. In other words, maybe he was afraid if he said they were dancing to the Barefoot Man, maybe he was afraid I was going to sick my lawyer on him, which, of course, I wouldn't do that. I'd be very honored if he just gave the right name. But uh, by the end of the day, he said they were dancing to the Barefoot Boys. And... Uh, and then when I met, I met Sidney Polak, who was the director of the movie here, and we talked a little bit. And he basically said one of the their agreements was that he wanted the the movie as as close as possible to his book. 
And so that's why I think, and, you know, we were chosen because a lot of, over the years, a lot of people have heard us perform here in Cayman and the Barefoot Man Band, that type of thing. So I think that's probably why. I've never spoken to Mr. Grisham and got his confirmation on that, but that's just a wild guess. Anyway, so they asked me to, to write a couple of little tunes, and there's, there's not, not a whole lot of my music in the movie, but there's enough in the movie to just get a royalty check on the odd occasion. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the best thing about being barefoot man? Oh, best thing about being barefoot man. Oh, well, you know, uh, I've uh, it's it's all been a dream come true. I think I mentioned earlier. I've always l loved the you know the island thing. I've always I, I, I lived when I was when I was very young. I lived inside of National Geographic magazines and in reading about Tahiti and the Cook Islands and Bora Bora and the Caribbean and 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 I when I in the summer in the summertime and and Wrightsville Beach North Carolina you know as kids we would just you know always be barefooted it would just made sense and 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 to me I figured everybody in the islands since it was summer year round they were always barefooted but I, to my surprise they weren't uh, and so by by being around, sort of being barefooted all the time, the islanders always looked at me and they're like, uh, they would say, uh, no shoes or no shoe man. And and then they got to be barefoot boy and and barefoot or just, or foot, all, that kind of thing. So that tag, that tag has always stuck. And when you think about it on a marketing aspect, the solo CD with, Caribbean music by the Barefoot Man rather than sell a CD by George Novak, it's going to do much better as the Barefoot Man. <laughs> yeah. So I always like to close my interviews. I just give the guest the microphone. Just let them take the stage. Wherever our listeners might be listening in, whenever, what would you say to anyone who's tuned in what would I say? Oh boy, there's a billion things to say. I, I, I uh, um, mm, I'm not a serious sort of a guy, you know, because everything I say usually turns into a, into some something, a joke. But you know what? I mean, you know, there's a lot. Of, I have met a lot of people who are inspired by my lifestyle, you know, and they, you know, gosh, you're so lucky, you live in the islands, et cetera, et cetera. And oh wow! And you, you, you. I read your story in this magazine, and blah blah. And the thing is, I, I think at the end of the day, you can sort of. Uh, I think if I send out any message, you can do anything you want. I mean, as I said, I, 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 I was worse in, in in English. I still am. For example, just you know, speaking. You know, my my wording is so so, but. A great story goes along with this once. Uh, there's a guy by the name of Paul Simolis. Paul Simolis passed away some time ago, but he was the publisher and editor, the main editor of Peterson Publishing Company, which published many magazines such as uh, Motorcycle Magazine, Hot Rod Magazine, and also Skin Diver Magazine. So Paul and his wife, Jerry, they would come to Cayman often, you know, to write stories and shoot pictures for their magazine and uh i told him a story once over a couple of drinks where i because i just got back from the cook islands and i went uh, diving uh with the pearl divers there who dive for mother of shell pearls on a atoll and called manahiki way out in the out in the middle of nowhere anyway it was just such an interesting experience for me and a dream come true for me to, to, to be out in the canoe with these guys and diving with them. Now, mind you, I couldn't keep up with them. They, they would dive down 180 feet or so. But but I, you know, hung around the water while they're doing this. And and then that, you know, then later on they had a, a, a luau, you know, I mean, a real luau. I mean, I'm talking about plastic grass skirts, the real thing. And, you know, it was just, just you know, you pinch yourself to death almost because you can't believe you're there. Anyway, I told him the story, and he says, gee whiz, I'd like for you to write that story for me 
for my magazine, Skin Diver. And and I explained to Paul, I says, Paul, I just I'm so bad with spelling, I'm so bad with punctuation, I'm so bad with my grammar. And then he he made an interesting point which I'll never forget. He says he says, George, he said, I've got twelve people who graduated from Harvard that work for me and they're editors. He says, But one thing they can't do, they can't tell a story. Hmm. So we're gonna take your story and these educated people are going to polish your story and that's why they're there that's why i have them on a payroll but they can't tell a story and they've never been anywhere and so you know and that really put a big boost in my in throughout my whole career and the interesting thing was after that paul hired me and he sent me to some other islands to 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 write other stories so here i am a guy who failed english in school making a living traveling around uh, writing articles for a major magazine so What's the moral of my story? I think you can do it. Anybody can do anything they want. Just do it. You know, don't sit around and dream about living in the island. Go, go give it a shot. What the hell, you know? Hmm. Just, just enjoy, enjoy life a little bit. I like that. All thank right. You. Well, Barefoot Man, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you for calling me, and I hope, you're, uh, I hope your listeners, you know, enjoyed our little talk. And... Uh, you know, and be sure to let them know they can go on my website and order some of my books about my travels, and they can also order uh, some CDs. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to be with you. Oh, it's a pleasure to do it. And for that website, it's barefootman.com. That's right. That's all there is to it. All right. Well, sir, until next time. Thank you very much, Paul. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.